Hey there, I'm Nyx, and the topic for this video is solving the move zeros problem on the LeetCode website. As always, solving this in the C++ language and giving you a detailed explanation of the entire process. So go through the planning of the algorithm, to the coding of it, to the analysis of it, looking at the time and space complexity, as well as the lead code rankings, which are always fun. If that sounds interesting to you, then stay tuned. Welcome back. Now, if you watched the last video, you know that we solved the replace elements with greatest element on right side video here. And now we're moving on to move zeros, but what about this one? Well, this one is the remove duplicates from sorted array problem, which was already done in a previous section. We already found a, an in-place algorithm for that problem, so um, skip. And we're down to move zeros here. Let's get right into it with that little side note done. Given an integer array, nums, we want to move all the zeros to the end of it while maintaining the relative order of the non-zero elements. Note that you have to do this in place without making a copy of the array. Okay. An example here. Every non-zero element gets shifted over to the beginning of the array, and all of the zeros present get shifted over to the end. And if we have an array of length 1, we don't have to do anything. And it is possible for us to be given an array of length 1, and all of the numbers fit into an integer 32 size, so okay. What immediately came to my mind when solving this problem is that this is actually very similar to the remove duplicates from sorted array and uh, the remove element problem. In essence, you shift over all of the non-zero numbers according to how many zeros you've already seen in that array. You've seen one zero, you shift over the number one place. You've seen two zeros, it will end up two places over as a result, and so on and so forth. That algorithm was already created as part of those previous two problems. The only difference, really, is that instead of not really caring what's left over at the end of the array after you've shifted the non-zero numbers, this problem you actually do care and you want them to be zero. So that leads me to thinking, okay, well, the basic algorithm from the previous problems should work, I just need to add on another loop that goes in reverse that replaces all of the values in that array in the required section with a zero. And it's going to go from the end of the array all the way to however many zeros you've counted in the first loop. Now, if you want a detailed explanation of uh, the portion of the code that is involved in remove element or remove duplicates from the sorted array, I will post a link to the remove element problem up in the corner for you. And that will go over all of the details to understanding the algorithm that handles the shifting of those elements. But since I've already covered that in a previous video, I'm just going to link it and move on directly to the code. First up, we need the integer to record how many zeros we have counted as we walk through the array, and we set that to zero. Next up is handling one of the edge cases where we're given an array that only has one thing in it. If the size of the array is less than two, well, regardless of whether it has a zero or a non-zero, we don't have to do anything to it, so we just simply return. This for loop will look very familiar to uh, those of you who've seen the previous videos. This is what handles the count of the zeros and the shifting of the non-zero numbers. So we go through the array from beginning to end, and if the value that we're currently looking at is equal to zero, we simply record that in the count. Otherwise, we're going to shift that non-zero number to the position of i minus count zeros, and set that equal to the current value that we're looking at. 
This section of code here is going to handle the last portion of this problem, which wants to convert all of the values at the end of the array that should be a zero to a zero. As a result, this for loop is going to start at the end of the array and look at the number of places that is equal to the count of the zeros. So this, in this example here, you've seen two zeros, so it's going to start at the end of the array and look at those two places and make sure that the value that they are set to is equal to zero. So in terms of an index, it wants to go until it's greater than or equal to the array size minus the count of the zeros. So in this case, 5 minus 2 would be 3. We want to go until we hit index of 3 or greater. And the reason that I've created an integer variable here, set it to the size minus the count, and use the integer here in the for loop is that I can't just have this portion directly in the for loop. It has problems correctly evaluating it, and if I put that in directly, it would essentially result in an error. Now this code will work, but before we go through with the whole shebang of button presses, I want to add in a couple of extra things to help optimize it and reduce the number of actual alterations to the array that aren't needed. Now going through this code, after we get to the for loop, what would you think happens if, say, we're given an array of all zeros? Well, this for loop needs to occur because this is the for loop that's going to count the zeros, and we don't know that we have an array full of zeros until we count them all. But after this count, the number of zeros is going to equal the array size. And then that's all well and good until we get into this for loop, which from reading it, you can probably see some redundant things are happening. This for loop is going to essentially go from the end of the array all the way to the beginning and replace the zeros with zeros, <laughs> which is a needless thing to do. In order to avoid the situation for all zeros, that's fairly easy. After this for loop occurs, if the count zeros variable is equal to the array size, well, we don't need to do anything because we've been given this kind of array, and this for loop never has to happen. But there are still further optimizations that I can add in this code. Because, for example, instead of being given this array, what if I'm given this one? Well, this one is eventually going to be shifted over to the very beginning. And I now need to go from the beginning of this array all the way to equal the number of counts of zeros that I saw, which is initially going through the array. This was a zero, two, three, four, five here. So we go one, two, three, four, five places from the end. And all of these I need to make sure are zero. But as you see here, I only really need to replace one thing, change one number in that array. All of the others are already zero, so I can just skip over those. So here, instead of always writing to a zero, even if they're already zeros, I want to be a little bit more discerning. And this is how I do it. So if the value that is supposed to be a zero is actually not a zero, in other words, we're dealing with a non-zero value, then I want to go ahead and set that value to zero. However, if I come across something that's not, I just simply want to continue on my merry way through the loop. Now, I can't break here because the break would just stop everything altogether. And I can't guarantee that I'm not first going to see a zero at the end, so I need to continue and go through all of those 
places to make absolutely sure it's a zero when it's supposed to be a zero. Because I could have zeros at the very end, I could have a patch of non-zero numbers that I need to convert, I can have another patch of zeros, and depending on the specific properties of the array, I'm not entirely sure in that section that I need to look at what values where will need to be changed, so I need to look at that entire section to guarantee it. So continue serves that function well. Now with all of that added, this code should work well. So let's see if that is true and I am right. Okay, so it handles that example code. And let's go ahead and submit. Pending, judging, accepted. Woohoo! All right, now let's go over the time and space complexity of this thing. Well. Space complexity is easy with this being an in-place algorithm. Don't need to make any containers outside of what is already given to us, nums. I only create a couple of variables here to be used as part of the algorithm. And those integer variables require just constant space. So this algorithm is big O of one space complexity. Time complexity, however, is a little interesting. Now here you're only seeing a for loop here and a for loop here. No nested for loops and a for loop that is here dependent on the array size, you might think that this could be, oh, big O of n, right? Well, we can be a little bit more descriptive than that. Yes, this for loop fully depends on the array size. Bigger the array, the more times this for loop has to execute. So this would be big O of n. But what about this for loop down here? From the way it's set up, how many iterations this for loop goes through is dependent on what happens in this for loop. It depends on the count of the zeros. If we have an array given to us that doesn't contain any zeros, then this for loop essentially isn't going to run. Because if we're given an array of, say, size 3, num zeros is going to say, hey, you only go if the index is greater than or equal to that number, 3, but the index is initially set to 3 minus 1 or 2. So it's already at the beginning less than what is required for it to run. So this for loop never executes. If on the other hand, we have an array that it consists of almost all zeros, it is going to run for almost that array size, but it's never going to equal it. The only way it's going to ever equal it is if we were given an array full of zeros and this if statement ensures that we never get to this for loop anyway in that situation. So this for loop, we can instead have this dependent on another variable, which we can call m. And m would be equal to the number of zeros we've seen in the previous for loop. So this would be equal in terms of its time complexity to big O of n, where n is equal to the size of the array, plus m, where m is equal to the number of zeros present in the array. With that, let's go and see where rankings are. Do, 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 do. Okay, fairly tight runtime, fairly uh, eh, bell distributed. Uh, neato that I'm fairly high, but again, take this with a grain of salt. And memory usage, again, very, very tight boundary. So, okay, not seeing too much in terms of distributions. So to me, this distribution can mean that all of the various solutions being thought up have fairly close running times to each other. There might not be big differences in terms of their time complexities. So this was the uh, first solution, but there is a second solution that uses a different methodology here. So let's reset the code and move on to that type of solution. Now that solution 
is going to go again go through the array but it's going to handle getting the zeros to where they need to be and getting the non zeros where they need to be at the same time so no having another for loop present now how do you go through this problem with only one loop well essentially you can do that by switching the places of the zeros and the non zeros and keeping track of the position of the next zero uh, you need to switch with in other words come on handy dandy whiteboard let's help me work through this so we have this array we go through it and we have our index and we also let's say have a integer to hold where the position of a zero is and initially they're going to be the same thing and we're going to walk through the array until we see that zero now until we see a zero we don't really need to do anything the non zeros we see are already in the place that they need to be like one and two here but once we have seen that zero now we need to start switching places with the non zeros that we see after this place so here the next one we see is this three so three will go here and zero will move here now zero is in the place where the three was and we want to make sure that that zero position stays with that zero while the index of our current position moves on we see a four here so four moves to where the zero is now and that zero moves over again and we can see now that this array is how it should be all of the non zeros are at the beginning all of the zeros are at the end so going over things we need a variable to hold the position of a zero that needs to be switched we need to go through the array and if we see a non-zero and we know we're in a situation where that zero position and the current index are not equal to each other well we can switch the values if they are equal to each other then we can just continue moving on and increase that zero position to continue trying to find a zero if we see a zero well we don't have to do anything those are the basic components of the algorithm so let's get to coding that okay here is our zero position holder and I've just set that to the beginning of the array zero now is when the for loop comes in for loop starts at the beginning of the array goes until the end and the first thing that we do is evaluate whether we've seen a non-zero but we have not seen a zero to switch with yet so if the value at position i is not equal to zero so we're dealing with some non-zero value and the current index is exactly the same as that zero position so if they're still the same then we have not seen a zero yet and there's nothing to switch places with so we'll just increment that zero position on and push it forward to try to find a zero in this array now the alternative is if we find a non-zero and those positions are now not equal in other words we have passed over a zero we are going to conduct the switch so set nums at the zero position equal to the value at the current position and set the value at the current position just equal to zero and also increment up that zero position to try to find the next zero let's go through an example to make sure this code doesn't have any issues any errors in it and to make sure we understand what it's doing so at the beginning of the array both the zero position integer and the index are set to zero and now we go through the array if we see a zero well nothing really happens in terms of the operations to execute but you notice what's key is what is not going to happen in both of these if statements the zero position increments but both of these statements are when we see a non-zero so as soon as we see a zero the zero position freezes at that point but the index continues to move on 
So mm, we are at a zero, we are at a zero, neither of these branches hold. So the zero position stays at zero, but the index moves on to one. For loop starts over, and now we're at this place. So we do have a non-zero value, and looking at this one, well, is index equal to the zero position? No! So this branch is going to execute since this condition is true. And we are now going to switch these places. So we're going to set the value at the zero position, so nums at zero here. We're going to set equal to the value at the current index position here. So this is going to change to one. Then this line executes, and it's going to set the value at the current position here, since i equals one, to zero. And we're going to increment the zero position, because it was initially here, where the zero was. Now we want to move it up to one. And we're now going to move on. We he see here at index two, another zero, doesn't execute any of the branches, so we move on and we are now at index three. At this point, we've seen another non-zero. So the index and the zero position are really never going to be the same again. So this if branch is also going to switch positions here. Nums at zero position of one becomes three, and the current position at index three becomes zero and we increment that zero position to two now. So we're looking at this position here, and once this loop goes again, looking at the last position here, 12, this branch is going to execute again, gonna get that to 12 and that to zero, and presto, we have our array. Now looking at this example, it works well. Looking at some edge cases here, well, what if we are given that array size that only has one thing in it? What's going to happen? Well, okay, zeros, nothing executes within this loop, we're good. If it's any non-zero number, then it's going to execute, look at the value, but the i and the zero position are going to be the same. The only thing it's going to do is increment that zero position once, and as soon as that loop executes once, the index is going to increment out of bounds, and the for loop is going to stop. So this for loop as written automatically covers that edge case of being given an array with only one value in it. What about in a situation where, in that example, we never saw this branch execute? Well, let's think of an example that does do that. Let's go with mine that I used in the planning phase. Well, what happens here? Zero, zero. Now, in this example, this first branch does execute. We are dealing with a non-zero value, but the index and the zero position are the same. So we don't bother doing needless switching around when we don't have to, and all we do is bump up the zero position with the index. So zero position executes, four branch continues on, index iterates up, and we look at two, same thing happens. We move on, and we finally get to a zero. Now, when we go through this for loop, the index will increment up with the for loop, but since neither of those if statements happened, the zero position integer will not, and will freeze itself exactly where we want it to be frozen, at the position of a zero. And then from that point on, it will behave exactly as it did in the previous situation. We switch three with zero here, we switch four and zero here, and we get exactly what we want. All right, now going through those examples might not feel strictly necessary when you're working problems in lead code, because lead code is awesome in the sense that it has a bunch of test cases for you, and you can always plug it in here, and I could have gone through 
that and say, hey, lead code, evaluate this for me and can indicate whether something goes wrong or whether it goes well. But I tend to want to avoid that because the exercise of going through the code myself, walking through it and seeing the logic execute in my own head is a really good way to thoroughly understand the code that I've written. And in a technical interview, I'm not going to likely have a handy dandy website that does the evaluation of test cases and edge cases for me. I'm going to be expected to do that myself. So as much as possible, I tend to avoid having Leet Code do that for me. I want to do that myself first. So that's why I went through that process and why I encourage you guys, if you're working through Leet Code problems, to do that as well. Okay, with that PSA done, uh, let's go and see if this code actually executes as I think it should. Okay, this is a good sign. Let's submit. Pending. And accepted! Woohoo! Uh, I love green. Green is awesome. Okay, next up, as usual, let's go through the time and space complexity f of this. Again, this is an in place solution. I didn't have to make any new container that depends on the uh, size of the array. It's only one individual integer and the loops. And because of that, this is going to mean that the space complexity is constant. So big O of one space complexity. In terms of time complexity, this is an improvement from the previous solution. Whereas that previous solution had a big O of n plus m time complexity, this one is just going to have big O of n because it consists of one loop that does constant time work and this depends on the array size. So big O of n time complexity. Okay, let's see where we are in terms of exactly the same place I was in the previous solution. I didn't even bounce around and it didn't register my memory. Well, I want to see if it me registers my memory. So I'm going to try this one more time and see if it works. If it ever loads. Come on. There we go. All right. Try this again. Pending. Accepted. Moving on. And I'm again right here. And again, I don't record it. Well, <laughs> all right. I'm stubborn. <laughs> okay, cut to this attempt where it ping-ponged me down here with the code, but it finally registered my memory usage. So 56.51%, uh, but again, same time complexity. And note, I didn't change anything. I was just being stubborn and wanted a you are here sign to it. Anyway. That is it for the move zeros problem. I hope you got something useful out of this video. And as always, I will wish you happy coding and to have a nice day.